All righty, good to see you here tonight. Glad you made it through the snow. Came at just the wrong time, didn't it? And uh, but it's good to glad you persevered and made it through. And maybe there'll be a few others sliding in here in a little bit. But uh, glad you made it and uh, looking forward to a good service together. Well, take your Bible this evening and go to Esther chapter 5. Esther chapter 5. All right. Things are getting exciting in Shushan the palace as Esther prepares to go in to see the king when she has not been invited in to see the king. So we'll see what's going to happen here, chapter 5. Verse number 1 now came to pass on the third day, and they've been fasting now for three days, remember? Esther put on her royal apparel and stood in the inner court of the king's house over against the king's house. And the king sat upon his royal throne in the royal house over against the gate of the house. And it was so when the king saw Esther the queen standing in the court that she obtained favor in his sight. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. So Esther drew near and touched the top of the scepter. Then said the king unto her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? And what is thy request? It shall be given thee to half the kingdom. And Esther answered, If if it seem good to the king, let the king and Haman come this day unto the banquet that I prepared for him. Then the king said, Cause Haman to make haste, that he may do as Esther has said. So the king and Haman came to the banquet that Esther had prepared. And the king said unto Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it shall be granted thee. What is thy request? Even to the half of the kingdom it shall be performed. Then answered Esther and said, My petition and my request is, If I have found favor in the sight of the king, and if it please the king to grant my petition, and to perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow as the king has said. Then went Haman forth that day joyful, And with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up, nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. And when he came home, he sat and called for his friends and Zeresh his wife. And Haman told them of the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him. And now he had advanced him above all the princes and servants of the king. And Haman said, Moreover, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king under the banquet that she had prepared but myself. And tomorrow am I invited unto her also with the king. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, Let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king under the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. Now, Father, add your blessing to the reading of our scripture here tonight. And Lord, I pray that uh, you would open our understanding as we uh, begin to uh, glean the, the truths from this chapter. And, and we unfold the story just a little bit more uh, of what you are doing uh, in the lives of the Jews and in the lives of the Persians here in Shushan the palace. And Lord, I'm praying that you'll uh, minister the truths to each of our hearts that will help us to be better servants of yours. So Holy Spirit, be our teacher tonight and help us, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's review a little bit, all right? Uh, you know that Ahasuerus, or Xerxes as he's called at times, uh, held a six-month feast and uh, at the beginning of the book of Esther, which he invited all the governors and the princes and showing them the glory of his kingdom and uh, had, had quite a big party going on. And during that feast, everybody got drunk and he wanted uh, his queen at that time, Vashti, to come in and to uh, show herself to all the men there. And, of course, she refused to do so and so lost her position as queen. And so a contest was made uh, to choose a successor. And uh, they had, I'm sure, hundreds of girls, if not thousands, come throughout the kingdom to participate. 
And uh, the one chosen was a Jewish girl, not known to be Jewish. Wasn't, wasn't a, the king was unaware of that fact, but her name was Esther. And she was chosen to be the next queen. Now Esther was reared by her older cousin, Mordecai. He had taken care of her. And uh, meanwhile, in the kingdom, King Asahiris, or King Xerxes, had, had promoted a man named Haman to be basically his right-hand man. Uh, he was above everybody. And a place of great power and great authority. And is, in fact, so much so, people would bow to him much like they would the king. Except one man wouldn't bow. Mordecai. And boy, that just got under Haman's skin. If you recall, we said Haman uh, was an Agagite. Uh, he was a descendant of the Amalekites. Uh, that's who God had given Saul the commandment to utterly destroy. And he didn't obey. And so, this comes back. And of course, he knows, Mordecai knows that. and or, uh, Haman knows that. And once he finds out Mordecai is, Mordecai is a Jew, uh, he doesn't just want to kill Mordecai. He wants to kill all the Jews. He wants to do what God intended and what, what Israel should have done to all the Amalekites. And so he wants to return the favor, if you will. And so Mordecai, he gets to Haman, or Haman gets the king uh, to issue an edict. Uh, he really gets Haman to issue it in his name. And in fact, he gives Haman his ring off his finger. And he says, you seal it with the king's ring. That means it can't be altered. Nobody can change it. Uh, it's the law of the Medes and the Persians. Can't be changed. Can't be altered. And so he's got the king's signet, his king's signature, if you will, and he agrees to do that. And of course, when that edict is signed, Mordecai puts on the sackcloth and the ashes and lets a great cry out and wailing. And he's not the only one. He did out in the public square. And, uh, and then Jews throughout the land are doing it. And word finally comes to Esther what's going on. And uh, you remember the story? She sent out a change of clothes because you can't wear sackcloth in the, in the palace. You can't be sad in the king's presence. And, uh, and Mordecai refused it. And so finally she sends Hatak, her chamberlain, to say, well, what's going on? And Mordecai tells her and sends her a, 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 a copy of the decree of all the Jews to be exterminated. All the Jews are to be killed. And uh, he said, you've got to do something about this. And, and at first Esther said, uh, not me. <laughs> not me. I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, I haven't been called to see the king for 30 days. And he, if you go in to see him and he hasn't called for you, uh, it's off with your head. Uh, you, so he said, well, you, you're, if you think, you know, this is your opportunity. And if you don't do it, uh, don't think you're going to be spared. You're going to die just like everybody else. And, and so that, that finally kind of got to Esther. And she said, all right, here's what we'll do. You fast and pray for me. You fast for three days. And my maiden and I will fast. And then I'll go to the king. And so that's how we left it when we ended last week. They're fasting. And I think along with that, always the Jews would not just fast, but they'd fast and pray. And I think they're seeking the Lord on this and asking for his help and his protection. And I believe God answers this. You're going to see this as we go into chapter 6. I mean chapter 5, all right? So that's where we are. And she goes into the king. And of course we read it. And number one on your paper there, you're filling it out, is Esther appears before the king. She'd fasted and prayed for three days and sought God and others had done the same thing. Do you notice that she put on her royal apparel? Before she went in, she made herself presentable. She made herself beautiful. Uh, she didn't. She didn't go in uh, looking like she just spent three days you know, not eating or drinking. Okay, not like the Pharisees. Remember, they like to disfigure themselves and make it look like they'd really been fasting. No, no. She she prettied herself up and uh, made sure that uh, she could be presentable to the king. And she uh, she didn't. Worry about, listen, she didn't spend time and her getting anxious over it. She didn't spend time getting depressed about the situation. Um, she simply <clears throat> went in to uh, get an audience with the king. She doesn't drawing undue attention to herself. Uh, she put on her royal apparel like, like any other time. And uh, she followed the normal rules of decorum and respect. All right. Now the, the king, the Bible says, verse 2, he saw Esther standing in the outer court. 
and she obtained favor in his sight. Anytime you see that phrase in the Bible, that's, that, that, when somebody gained favor in somebody's sight, that's because of God. Okay? Joseph got favor of the keeper of the prison when he was put in prison. Who gave him that? God did. Uh, Daniel got favor with the prince of the eunuchs when they were taken captive. Who gave him that? God gave him that. Uh, so this is God working and God giving her favor in the, in the sight of the king. He holds up the golden scepter. Ding, 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 ding. Okay? And uh, he holds that up and she goes over and touches top of it. Now it's important. Not only was it letting her know you can come in, it was letting the guards know you don't have to have an execution today. All right? And uh, you're going to be okay. You, you uh, relax, guys. Okay? And, and she goes in and touches it. And uh, but knowing, again, presenting herself for the king without permission would mean instant execution. Uh, that's just the, the way they operated in those days. So he holds up, and he doesn't just hold it up. He asked her, What wilt thou, Queen Esther? What is thy request? It shall be given thee to half the kingdom. I, I think, first of all, she's got to be relieved that she saw that scepter go up. That has to be... I can imagine as she's standing there waiting for the king to notice her. It must have seemed like forever. And the heart beating out of her chest, probably. If you've ever been in a situation like that. And boy, to see it rise up, what a relief. And, and, and what's the request? And I'll give it to you up to half the kingdom. Well, God has answered her prayer. She's got an audience with the king. You and I probably would have said, man, let me tell you what's going on. <laughs> huh? But that's what she did. It's amazing. Number two, Esther shows great wisdom. You and I probably would have just blurted it out. But she doesn't. All the, I think with all the tension of three days of waiting, with the tension of standing there not knowing if he's going to raise the scepter or not, what kind of mood is he in today? Who knows? What, will he accept me? Will he not? Uh, it, she, doesn't, uh, she doesn't just pour her guts out, so to speak, okay? She doesn't just burst and bust out with it. She, she shows great patience and tactfulness here. As she begins, she kind of, she's going to butter him up is what she's going to do. And what she says is, she says, I, I, I want to have a banquet. And, and I just want two people to come, you and Haman. And I want you to come to my banquet. And of course, the king, as we know from chapter 1, he just had a six-month-long one. Uh, and that was years before now, of course. But uh, evidently, this guy was a pretty big party king, okay? Uh, he, liked, he liked banquets, okay? And he liked drinking wine. And so she knew how to, how to get him... Uh, ready, okay? And so she says, I want you to do this, and he was good. Hey, she's, she, she's dressed nice, she looks nice, she, she invites him to a meal, she's had nice food prepared, and uh, she's, she's ready to uh, plead her case. And, and as they go and they sit down, they have the meal, they start, they, they drink the wine. The wine was not come first, the wine would always come last. They always started with water, and the wine would come later. And so they've been there a while now. And in the king, verse 6, says to Esther at the banquet of wine, What is thy petition? And it will be granted thee. What is thy request? Even to half the kingdom it shall be performed. And here we are. Now come on, Esther, tell me what you really want. Tell me what this is all about. I'm going to give you whatever you ask me for. Just name your favor. Just, just name it and you'll have it. Well, I don't know about you, but I think I'd have just let her go right there. <laughs> I'd have just let her rip and tell him, tell him this guy right here is a dirt bag. And uh, he's trying to kill us all. And it would be the slave law version of the Bible, you understand. But he says, he's going to kill us all and you, you only you can help us and we've got to do something about this. But she doesn't do any of that. It's amazing, the, the, the wisdom. She's, they fasted, they prayed for this moment. You have an audience with the king. You're the only one you can talk to him for such a time as this. And you know what she does? She invites him to another banquet. She invites him to another meal. She says, verse 7, My petition and my request is, and I think everybody leans over, like, you know, E.F. Hutton's going to talk. Everybody's listening. And she says, 
If I found favor in the sight of the king, if it pleased the king to grant my petition and perform my request, let the king and Haman come to the banquet that I shall prepare for them, and I will do tomorrow, as the king has said. Hey, I'm going to tell you what I want, king, but we need to have another banquet tomorrow. And just you and Haman come again. Wow. And you know what's amazing? He said, okay. Huh? I don't know about you, I'd have said, no way, sweetheart. You're going to come, come with it right now. Let's just get on with this. What do you want? But you see, God had put her in favor with the king. And that made him accept it. See? It's, so, it's amazing how, it, it, it's amazing when you read the story how people really believed they were doing what they wanted, but God was getting what he wanted. You understand? And, and it was going just to, exactly according to plan. But that's, that's great wisdom that Esther played. Now, let me ask you a question. Where do you think she got that idea? Where do you think she got the idea that I'm not just going to come right out, I'm going to have a banquet, and I'm going to invite her back to a second banquet? You see? You know what I think she got that? I think she got that when she was fasting and praying and asking God what she should do. When you fast and pray, then remember we said fasting and praying was letting go of the visible to grab hold of the invisible. Letting go of the material to grab hold of the spiritual. And, and so you want to draw nigh to God and God opens up the, the communication with you when you do that. When you desire to draw nigh to Him, then He draws nigh to you. And you get intuition and you get the leading of God that you don't get otherwise. And Esther, I believe, got that. And, and people will argue with our beliefs. And they may judge our moral positions. But it's really hard to argue against love and kindness. And that's what she's pouring on right here. Love and kindness. The world says, kill your enemies. And God says, yeah, go ahead and kill them with kindness kindness be good to them that that persecute you and despitefully use you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my name's sake okay so bless them so we see the wisdom of Esther and then number three we see Esther shows her humility as I said before she could have jumped right up pointed the finger made accusations demanded Haman's blood uh, but she didn't do any of that She's inviting her enemy to dinner. She's inviting him to the banquet, not knowing really what will happen. She has to be careful. This, this is not just any guy. This is his right-hand man. This is who the king has promoted to be the number one guy in the kingdom. If you say right off the bat, man, this guy's a dirtbag. This guy is horrible. He's, he's a bad guy. What are you saying about the king's judgment? Boy, you sure don't know how to pick them. What would you put this guy in his position for? She's criticizing in a roundabout way. She's criticizing the king for, his, for the guy she appointed. And so she has to be very, very careful. And she shows her humility here. She, she, she consists in an area where the king likes to promote himself, where Haman likes to promote himself. And by the way, that's what the world likes to do. The world's real good at talking about themselves. Esther always promoted others. Esther always looked out for somebody else. We're here, we're, we're here to bless the lives of others. We're not just here for ourselves. We're here to make a difference. In our life? No, in other people's lives. And influence other people's lives. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Don't just be looking out for yourself. Say, well, you just got to look out for number one. Yeah, now what, what chapter and verse was that again? It's exactly where is that in the Bible. In fact, maybe we should look out for number one, but in the Christian's life, just who is number one? <laughs> Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. He's number one. Well, we see, so she says, I want you to come to the banquet tomorrow. And... Uh, I will do tomorrow as you've asked me. Well, that's, uh, th that's over. And they leave. And Haman leaves. Verse 9. And we see number 4 in your paper. There's the pride and arrogance of Haman. The pride and arrogance of Haman. Now we see it. 
Here it is. Then Haman, then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. I mean, he is just, how, how cool would it be? The queen had a dinner and two people were invited, the king and me. You know, I see him getting all Barney Fife on us, you know. Well, you see, it was just us. That's who it was. And he was just busting and just couldn't hardly contain himself. He, that's a pretty, and, and, and by the way, that's a lofty place. You think about it, if no matter who the President of the United States is, whether you like it or don't like it, or whether it was the guy before Trump, or you don't like Trump, or you don't like either one of them, but if you're invited to dinner at the White House, and you say, well, who's invited? Oh, just the President, his wife, and you. You would say, huh? I doubt you'd keep that to yourself. I think you'd probably tell a few people, I'm eating dinner at the White House. Oh yeah, who else is going to be there? Just the president, his wife, and moi. Okay? That's it. See? And, and pretty big deal. And Haman felt that way. He was pretty jazzed up about it all. And, and so he's pretty happy. He's walking on cloud nine, and he sees Mordecai in the king's gate. Mordecai doesn't stand up. In other words, he doesn't stop doing whatever he's doing, doesn't move for him. Whatever Mordecai's doing, he just kept on doing it. Everybody else stopped what they're doing and stood up, whether they saluted or whether they bowed, whatever they were doing, Mordecai paid no attention to him at all, and boy, it just boiled inside of him. Notice, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. But nevertheless, Haman refrained himself. Oh, that, don't, that is only temporary. He refrained himself till he got home. Then he let loose, okay? Notice what it says. When he came home, he sent and called for his friends and Zeresh, his wife. And Haman told them, here he is. You, you see his pride and his arrogance? What does he tell them about? He tells them about the glory of his riches and the multitude of his children and all the things wherein the king had promoted him and how he advanced him above the princes and servants of the king. He, he goes into his whole spiel about his whole life again. And I, 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 I got to believe some of those folks were, had to be rolling their eyeballs saying, now here we go again, listen to this speech. They, they, probably, they probably could turn and mouth the words because he's, he's probably said it so many times. You've heard the same story. You know, it, it, and, and, and he's just recounting how great he is, how wonderful he is. How, 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 how no one's promoted like he was and how he worked his way up and the king saw this, he saw in me the, the, what he's looking for in leadership and, and, and all the money and now the multitude of children I have and my descendants and look at all the friends and he's just going on and on and on. And he brags in verse 12, Yea, Esther the queen did let no man come in with the king unto the banquet that she had prepared but myself and tomorrow, I'm invited unto her also with the king. Hey, lest you think that was a fluke today, I'm going back tomorrow. Okay? This is, uh, this is big stuff. And so he's, hey, he, he, he just he loves it. Now all this, and then, then, he, then he tells him his problem. And of course, by the way, I, I think his wife and those friends, they, they just fed right into it. They just egged him on. There was nobody to, to keep him grounded. You know, you always, if, if, if there's any time you get success or you see promotion in your life or you, you go up the ladder, you know what? You always need people in your life to keep you grounded. I remember years ago, um, the, the Crown College of the Bible uh, that, that we have here on Tuesday nights and the, 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 that we get, uh, Clarence Sexton is the, the pastor there. Brother Sexton's been there a long time. I don't know how long he's been there, but he's been in the ministry for a long time. And, and he's pretty well known in, in our fundamental circles and such as a preacher and such. But I, I'll go back. Wow. I think it was in the late 80s. I'm almost 30 years ago. And he was due to speak at a, a pastor's conference out of Jack Trever's church. And we were there for that meeting. And Brother Trever was introducing him, Brother Moreland. Brother Sexton and his wife were, were sitting right down here on the front row. And Brother Trever was waxing rather eloquent on bragging about Dr. Sexton, what he had done. He used to work for Lee Robertson at 
Highland Park Baptist Church, and then he went to New Jersey and started a church and built a great work there, and just, just was going on and on. And when Dr. Sexton got up to speak, he, he said, when he was saying all those things about me, I leaned over to my wife, and I asked her, do you think he really believes all those things he's saying about me? And his wife looked at him and said, honey, it's okay if he believes them. Just don't you start believing them. <laughs> Boy, that'll ground you real quick, won't it? Huh? And that's, what, that's what wives are good for, all right? They keep you grounded, amen? You don't get too puffed up. Uh, you know what? Haman didn't have a wife like that. And, and, and he, he is... Haman needed people around him saying, you're the man. You the man. That's what he needed. He needed guys around him to pump him up. And, and, and his ego depended on the admiration of others. His ego depended on the admiration of others. I see Bob shaking his head. You probably work with people like that. They're down where you are. <laughs> oh, my. And uh, you, you have people like this. I'm sure you do. But you have to ask yourself this. Before you come down too hard on Haman for his arrogance or for his pride, you have to ask yourself something. Do we ever do the same thing? Do we promote Jesus with our words and our actions and our attitudes or do we just seek the attention for ourselves? Boy, that's quiet. So he's pretty excited about going to the banquet. But then he tells them what's bothering him. Verse 13. Yet all this availeth me nothing, so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. All that's worth nothing as long as Mordecai still sitting there. It just eats me up. So they're going to help him. They get an idea. Zeresh, his wife, and all his friends, this is what they said to him. Here's their advice. Their advice is, build a gallows. Now, the gallows they had is not the gallows that we have. When I think of a gallows, I think of the, like the arms through the holes and a head through the hole. Or the, the gallows there was just a, it was, think of a long spear. Straight up in the air. This, in this case, they're saying build one 75 feet high. Why so tall? They want everybody to see it. And you know what you should do? Impale Mordecai on the gallows. That's what they did. Much like, you used to have those things on your desk. Uh, it was a little thing with thing, and the thing stuck up. And you had pieces of paper and you'd stick them on there. You know what I'm talking about? That's what it kind of was. One of those stands and it went 75 feet in the air and they just stick a body on there. You just hang there. That was the gallows. And they said, that's what you ought to do to Mordecai first thing in the morning and then go to the banquet. Yeah, just, just commit murder, then go have a good meal, will you? I mean, go kill him and that will make you feel so good you'll feel like eating. And you know what? Mordecai said, yeah, I like that plan. I feel better already. And he commanded the gallows to be made. So they start preparing him and start doing that. I mean, if that's, hey, this is what your friends suggested you do. I don't know about you, but I think you need some new friends. I mean, when you're down and you're discouraged, your friends, their advice to you is, yeah, go ahead and kill the guy. I think you need some new friends. Okay? That's not good advice. But he thought that was a great idea. And he had the gallows set up. And that, that would lift his mood. Haman's You know, Haman's self-promotion, his pride, his arrogance, his shallowness, that, that brought out the worst in the people around him too. They fed into that. Birds of a feather, they flock together. That's, that's a, and that is a Bible principle, by the way. You, 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 you become like those you run with. You become like those you spend time with. And just, just contrast that, if you will. Just, just think about what a contrast between him and Esther in their behavior. 
Here's Esther making Haman feel very important. And she's even able to draw favor which God has given to her out of the king as well. Well, here we're going to find out number five. God's direction in the delay. You heard me say, I'm sure, listen, I, I, it's not written in here. This would just be just conjecture on my part. Just uh, thinking about how human nature would be. So, the day finally comes. Mordecai, all the other Jews have been fasting and praying, waiting for Esther to go in. So that if the day goes by, the evening comes. Don't you think Mordecai would have said, how did it go? I didn't hear anybody got executed, so I guess you got in. And yeah, I got in. Well, what did he say? Um, I didn't ask him anything. What? No, 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 no. It's okay, though. Uh, we, we had dinner, and we're having dinner again tomorrow. Well, why didn't you say something? I just didn't feel like it was the right time. Yeah, but how do you know tomorrow is going to be the right? I just believe that's the right I should do. I believe that's what God wants me to do. Well, why? Why? You know, there's some of us, we get pretty impatient. Come on, you had your opportunity. Why didn't you do something? Oh, why delay? Why wait another day? Well, I'll tell you why. For one reason or another, whether the king had indigestion from that meal or whether he was so excited about the next meal, he couldn't sleep that night. Look at chapter 6 and verse 1. On that night could not the king sleep. So he commanded to bring the book of the records of the chronicles. And they were read before the king. So he says, bring me the congressional record. <laughs> Boy, that'll put you to sleep. If you can't sleep at night, what do you do? You turn on C-SPAN. You know? <laughs> Let me watch something and put me to sleep. And, and so he's reading, these guys are reading to him from the congressional record. But guess where they read? It was found written that Mordecai had told of Big Than and Teresh, two of the king's chamberlains, the keepers of the door, who sought to lay hand on the king Ahasuerus. Of all the places they could read, of all the years and years of history, this is where they read. And the king says, Wait a minute. Look at verse 3. He said, What honor and dignity hath been done to Mordecai for this? Then said the king's servants that ministered unto him, There is nothing done for him. Nothing was ever done for him. And you know what? Mordecai never said anything. See, that, that delay was God working. That was God working. God had a direction in the delay. The morning comes. And the first guy to walk in to see the king is Haman. And the king speaks about him saying, well, what should the king do to the, to the one he wants to honor? Now who does think Haman, Haman thinks he's talking about? Who else would he want to honor but me? I'm, I'm, the big, I'm the big guy around here. And so you're going to find out, we're, we're not going to do that tonight, we're going to do that next week, about what happens. Here's what I want you to think about this evening. I want you to ask yourself a question. In what ways, ask yourself this question, in what ways am I guilty of self-promotion? I don't think this is on your paper. I just want to, Talk to you, man. Oh, we may not be vying for positions, our top positions of power or influence in the nation, but we seek, look at me, we seek self glorification in other ways in our self glorification society. Facebook, Twitter. Instagram. You know what those are? Self-promotion tools. 
See what I'm doing here? See what I'm eating here? Hear what I'm thinking here? Like what I like? Oh, nobody, only two people liked what I put down. <laughs> Self promotion. We put, we put pictures up so somebody can say, Oh, you're so beautiful. Oh, you're so pretty. Kind of nervous laughs, aren't they? Hmm? Think I'm pretty with my selfie? Selfie? Selfish? Think I'm smart? Think I'm macho? Think I'm clever? Think I'm cute? How's my hair? How's my outfit? One of the greatest self-promotional tools ever invented. Could you, could you try to not self-promote for about a month? Not promote yourself at all? But maybe promote Jesus? But there's other culprits. You know, John the Baptist said he must increase and I must decrease. It's good advice for the Christian. He must increase and I must decrease. But it's not just social media that we can call out bragging in all forms and types is self-promotion. Making sure somebody knows what you did. Boasting. Sometimes we boast over others who made a mistake and we make sure everybody knows what they did because sometimes somehow sometimes in our mind tearing somebody else down makes us look bigger and in the truth it makes us look smaller doing things that just draw attention to me wanting people to notice me wanting the people to be impressed by me You know, the world, the world loves to live their lives believing they're the center of the universe. That everything revolves around them. I thank, I thank God for my mom. You know, I was in college. I'm in Bible college. And at Brother Yoder, I was working at Camp Choff in the summer. I was a lead counselor. I'm a big shot. <laughs> and I, I, you know, it, you, in those days, camp, we went out on Sunday evening after church and you stayed all week until Saturday breakfast. And after breakfast Saturday, then the buses came and we'd all get out around noon, one o'clock Saturday afternoon and you'd go home and You'd have Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, Sunday church, Sunday night church, and then back out to camp Sunday night. And, uh, and I don't know what I was doing or not doing on Saturday or whatever, but uh, after a couple weeks, I got a letter at camp from my mom. And I thought, wow. My wow changed to a whoa real quick. And buddy... She unloaded on me. I don't remember everything that letter said, but I do remember this line. The world doesn't revolve around you. And she just let me have it. And wow, I didn't open my cabin door to walk out. I just slid right under it. <laughs> she just cut me down. And, and you know what? I needed it. She was right. You need people like that in your life. When you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you lay down self. Jesus said, if you're going to follow me, the first thing you do is deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Now, 
I live. Listen, we live not to promote us. We live to promote Jesus Christ. Oh, I know we give lip service to that. But do we really live it out? Do we like to take the credit? Do we like to let people know what we've done? Where we've been invited? What promotions we've gotten? The joy of life, satisfaction, contentment, happiness, purpose, they all get drained out when we live for self. The selfish life is a horrible way to live. It's always, as the Scripture says, it's always the flesh versus the Spirit. Capital S. And the Spirit of God versus the flesh. They're contrary one to the other. You can't, you can't serve God and money. You cannot walk in the Spirit and in the flesh. It's impossible. When you walk in the Spirit, the Bible says, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Who remembers what walk means? Take repeated steps in the same direction. When I take repeated steps in the same direction as the Spirit of God, I will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. But I have to take those repeated steps with the Spirit of God. And that comes from the Word of God. And when you take, listen, that means when I take repeated steps with the Spirit of God, in obedience to His prompting in my heart, I don't even think of self. See, this, this idea of, of i got to think I'm something. I gotta, no, I'm no, I'm nobody. Without Christ, I can do nothing. i got to have Him. And so, and so anything that gets accomplished isn't because of me. It's because of Jesus Christ. So give God the glory. Give God the credit. And be a blessing to others. Don't, we, we have to be careful because we can all have some Haman in us and want to be self-promoting and, and, and get so upset when something doesn't go the way we want it to. Everybody here at times has had a Mordecai in their life. Everything's good. Everything's great. Oh, this one. Got one thing or one person or something that just just makes your blood boil. Why? Because he isn't doing something for me. That's your question. Was Mordecai disrespectful to the king? No. He saved his life. Didn't he? So he's loyal to the king. Subject to the king. He just wasn't giving that to Haman. Isn't that what happens to us? We get upset with somebody and we get so angry with somebody. And listen, it's not because they're disrespecting our Lord. It's because we don't like them. or they don't, We feel like they don't like us. Is it about him? Or is it about me? It's supposed to be about Him. Let's promote Him and not ourselves. So the king has Haman come in and he's asking Haman, what should I do to honor the man who I delight in? And we're going to find out what Haman tells him next week. Okay? Don't, don't come back next week, okay? And, uh, this is an exciting, exciting story. But you're going to see the humiliation, the defeat, and the death of Haman when we get together next Wednesday. All right? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Father in heaven, we thank you for this evening now. Thank you, Lord, for the word of God. Thank you for this wonderful, amazing story in the book of Esther. I'm so glad that you put this in the word of God. Lord, tonight, 
I'd ask you to help us to be Esther and not to be Haman. I think all of us, because of this flesh, struggle at times with being Haman. We want to be noticed. We want to promotion. We want recognition. We want that ego, that pride stroked. But Father, remind us that we are in Christ. And all we have is in Christ. That Jesus Christ has made to me all I need. All I need. It's in Him that I live and move and have my being. And I pray, Lord, that You'd help us to promote Jesus Christ. That He would increase. We would decrease. May others see Christ in our lives this week. And as He's lifted up in our life, may You draw all men unto Him. Dismiss us now with Your care, Lord. Thank You for each one that's come. Please give everyone safety over the roadways as they travel home. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Well, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. It's 498 if you need it. Let's sing it together, all right? Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love Him more and more. Jesus saves and keeps me, and He's the one I'm waiting for. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day God bless you, you're dismissed. Choir, come right on out.